Welcome back. Miss Cop here with your Harry Potter read aloud. Hope everyone is doing okay out there. I know the world is a little bit crazy right now, and that's part of why we're reading, right? Reading is a really great escape. Um, let yourself get distracted from stressful things in life for a little bit and get wrapped up in some magic. And Harry Potter, literally, right? In our last chapter, Harry just found out he is a wizard, which is pretty exciting. Based off of how terrible his life was with the Dursleys, I think that finding out that he was getting to leave them, no matter the circumstances, he probably would have been pretty stoked. But finding out that he gets to leave the Dursleys and that he is going to a magical school, man, his life just did a 180. He's got to be pretty excited. So let's find out what's the next step now that he's a wizard, what's going to happen? Today we're reading chapter 5, which is called Diagonally. And let's get started. Harry woke early the next morning. Although he could tell it was daylight, he kept his eyes shut tight. It was a dream, he told himself firmly. I dreamed a giant called Hagrid came to tell me I was going to a school for wizards. When I open my eyes, I'll be at home in my cupboard. There was suddenly a loud tapping noise. And there's Aunt Petunia knocking on the door, Harry thought, his heart sinking. But he still didn't open his eyes. It had been such a good dream. Tap, tap, tap. All right, Harry mumbled. I'm getting up. He sat up and Hagrid's heavy coat fell off of him. The hut was full of sunlight. The storm was over. Hagrid himself was asleep on the collapsed sofa and there was an owl wrapping its claw on the window, a newspaper held in its beak. Harry scrambled to his feet. So happy, he felt as though a large balloon was swelling inside him. He went straight to the window and jerked it open. The owl swooped in and dropped the newspaper on top of Hagrid, who didn't wake up. The owl then fluttered onto the floor and began to attack Hagrid's coat. Don't do that. Harry tried to wave the owl out of the way, but it snapped its beak fiercely at him and carried on savaging the coat. Hagrid, said Harry loudly, there's an owl. Pay him, Hagrid grunted into the sofa. What? He wants paying for delivering the paper. Look in the pockets. Hagrid's coat seemed to be made of nothing but pockets. Bunches of keys, slug pellets, balls of string, peppermint humbugs, tea bags. Finally, Harry pulled out a handful of strange-looking coins. Give him five nuts, said Hagrid sleepily. Nuts? The little bronze ones. Harry counted out five little bronze coins, and the owl held out his leg so Harry could put the money into a small leather pouch tied to it. Then he flew off through the open window. Hagrid yawned loudly, sat up, and stretched. Best be off, Harry. Lots to do today. Got to get her up to London and buy all your stuff for school. Harry was turning over the wizard coins and looking at them. He had just thought of something that made him feel as though the happy balloon inside him had a, got a puncture. Um, Hagrid? Hmm? said Hagrid, who was pulling on his huge boots. I haven't got any money, and you heard Uncle Vernon last night. He won't pay for me to go and learn magic. Don't worry about that, said Hagrid, standing up and scratching his head. Do you think your parents didn't leave you anything? But if their house is destroyed, they didn't keep their gold in the house, boy. Nah, first stop for us is Gringotts, Wizard's Bank. Have a sausage, they're not bad cold. And I wouldn't say no to a bit of your birthday cake, neither. Wizards have banks? Just the one, Gringotts, run by goblins. Harry dropped a bit of sausage he was holding. Goblins? Yeah, they'd be mad to try and rob it. I'll tell you that. Never mess with goblins, Harry. Gringotts is the safest place in the world for anything you want to keep safe, except maybe Hogwarts. As a matter of fact, I gotta visit Gringotts anyway, for Dumbledore, Hogwarts business. Hagrid drew himself up proudly. He usually gets me to do important stuff for him. Fetching you, getting things from Gringotts, knows he can trust me, see? Got everything? Come on, then. Harry followed Hagrid out onto the rock. The sky was quite clear now, and the sea gleamed in the sunlight. The boat Uncle Vernon had hired was still there with a lot of water in the bottom after the storm. How did you get here? Harry asked, looking around for another boat. Flew, said Hagrid. Flew? Yeah, but we'll go back in this. I'm not supposed to use magic now that I've got you. They settled down in the boat. Harry still staring at Hagrid, trying to imagine him flying. Seems a shame to row, though, said Hagrid, giving Harry another of his sideway looks. 
If I was to er, speed things up a bit, would you mind not mentioning it at Hogwarts? Of course not, said Harry, eager to see more magic. Hagrid pulled out the pink umbrella again, tapped it twice on the side of the boat, and they sped off toward land. Why would you be mad to try and rob Gringotts? Harry said. Spells, enchantments, said Hagrid, unfolding his newspaper as he spoke. They say there's dragons guarding the high security vaults, and then you gotta find your way out. Gringotts is hundreds of miles under London Sea, deep under the underground. You'd die of hunger trying to get out, even if you did manage to get your hands on something. Harry sat and thought about this while Hagrid read his newspaper at the Daily Prophet. Harry had learned from Uncle Vernon that people liked to be left alone while they did this, but it was very difficult. He never had so many questions in his life. Ministry of Magic messing things up as usual, Hagrid muttered, turning the page. There's a Ministry of Magic? Harry asked before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hagrid. They want a Dumbledore for Minister, of course, but he'd never leave Hogwarts, so old Cornelius Fudge got the job. Bungler, if there ever was one. So he pelts Dumbledore with owls every morning, asking for advice. But what does a Ministry of Magic do? Well, their main job is to keep it from the muggles that there's still witches and wizards up and down the country. Why? Why? Why me? Harry ever would be wanting magic solutions to their problems. Nah, we're best left alone. At this moment, the boat bumped gently into the harbor wall. Hagrid folded up his newspaper, and they clambered up the stone steps onto the street. Passers-by stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town to the station. Harry couldn't blame them. Not only was Hagrid twice as tall as anyone else, he kept pointing at perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, See that, Harry? Things these muggles dream up, eh? Hagrid, said Harry, panting a bit as he ran to keep up. Did you say there are dragons at Gringotts? Well, so they say, said Hagrid. Crikey, I'd like a dragon. You'd like one? Wanted one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They had reached the station. There was a train to London in five minutes' time. Hagrid, who didn't understand muggle money, as he called it, gave the bills to Harry so he could buy their tickets. People stared more than ever on the train. Hagrid took up two seats and sat knitting what looked like a canary yellow circus tent. Still got your letter, Harry? he asked as he counted stitches. Harry took the parchment paper out of his pocket. Good, said Hagrid. There's a list there of everything you need. Harry unfolded a second piece of paper he hadn't noticed the night before and read, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Let me show you. Here's the list of all the different things that he's going to need to buy for his class. Uniform. First year students will require three sets of plain work robes, black. One plain pointed hat, black for day wear. One pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar. One winter cloak, black, silver fastening. Please note that all pupils' clothes should carry name tags. Course books. All students should have a copy of each of the following. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1, by Miranda Goshawk. A History of Magic, by Bathilda Bagshot. Magical Theory, by Adabot Wasping. A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration, by Emmerich Switch. 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, by Philia Spohr. Magical Drafts and Potions, by Arsenis Jigger. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, by Newt Scamander. The Dark Forces, A Guide to Self-Protection by Quentin Trimble. Man, those sound pretty different from any of the books I ever had as a student. What about you? What do you think? Do those sound more fun than your textbooks? Other equipment. One wand, one cauldron, pewter, standard size 2. One set glass or crystal files. One telescope, one set brass scales. Students may also bring an owl or a cat or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks. Can we buy all this in London? Harry wondered aloud. If you know where to go, said Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before. Although Hagrid seemed to know where he was going, he was obviously not used to getting there in an ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier on the underground and complained loudly that the seats were too small and the trains too slow. I don't know how the muggles manage without magic he said as they climbed a broken-down escalator that led up to a bustling road lined with shops. Hagrid was so huge that he parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was keep close behind him. They passed bookshops and music stores, hamburger restaurants and cinemas, but nowhere that looked as if they could sell you a magic wand. This was just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. 
Could there really be piles of wizard gold buried miles beneath them? Were there really shops that sold spell books and broomsticks? Might this not all be some huge joke that the Dursleys had cooked up? If Harry hadn't known that the Dursleys had no sense of humor, he might have thought so. Yet somehow, even though everything Hagrid had told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt. The Leaky Cauldron, it's a famous place. It was a tiny, grubby-looking pub. If Hagrid hadn't pointed it out, Harry wouldn't have noticed it was there. The people hurrying by didn't glance at it. Their eyes slid from the big bookshop on one side to the record shop on the other as if they couldn't see the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry had the most peculiar feeling that only he and Hagrid could see it. Before he could mention this, Hagrid had steered him inside. For a famous place, it was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in a corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old bartender, who was quite bald and looked like a toothless walnut. <laughs> that was a very funny comparison. Our author, J.K. Rowling, gives us a lot of good descriptions, right? So good readers are making a movie of this in your mind. So now you're picturing this man, and you're trying to imagine this bartender, and his head looks kind of like a walnut. Hmm, maybe a little wrinkly? The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him, and the bartender reached for a glass, saying, The usual Hagrid? Can't, Tom. I'm on Hogwarts business, said Hagrid, clapping his great hand on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good Lord, said the bartender, peering at Harry. Is this... Can this be? The leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the old bartender. Harry Potter, what an honor. He hurried out from behind the bar, rushed toward Harry, and seized his hand, tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter, welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say. Everyone was looking at him. The old woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realizing it had gone out. Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs, and the next moment Harry found himself shaking hands with everyone in the leaky cauldron. George Crockford, Mr. Potter, can't believe I'm meeting you at last. So proud, Mr. Potter. I'm just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand. I'm all of a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter. Just can't tell you. Diggle's the name. Dedalus Diggle. I've seen you before, said Harry, as Dedalus Diggle's top hat fell off in his excitement. You bowed at me once in a shop. He remembers, cried Dedalus Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crockford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P-p-p-potter, stammered Professor Quirrell, grasping Harry's hand. C-c-can't tell you how pleased I am to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? Defense against the dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell, as though he'd rather not think about it. N -n not that you n need it, eh, P -p Potter? He laughed nervously. You'll be g -g getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've g got to, p to pick up a new book on vampires m m myself. He looked terrified at the very thought. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It took almost ten minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over the babble. Must get on, lobster by. Come on, Harry. Doris Crockford shook Harry's hand one last time, and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small walled courtyard, where there was nothing but a trash can and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry. Told you, didn't I? Told you he was famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you. Mind you, he's usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh yeah, poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest, and there was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. Scared of the students, scared of his own subject. Now, where's me umbrella? Vampires? Hags? Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the trash can. Three up, two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It wriggled in the middle. A small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway large enough even for Hagrid. 
an archway onto a cobbled street that twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid to Diagonally. He grinned at Harry's amazement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into a solid wall. The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons, all sizes, copper, brass, future, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, said a sign hanging over them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we got to get to your money first. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked down the street trying to look at everything at once. The shop, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. Maybe you've been in a situation like this where you, you were in a new place and there were so many exciting sights all at once and you were like, Harry, you wish you could have more eyes just so you could take it all in. A plump woman outside an apothecary was shaking her head as they passed saying, Dragon liver, 17 sickles an ounce, they're mad. A low soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sign saying, I lopes owl emporium. Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown, and Snowy. Several boys of about Harry's age had their noses pressed against a window with broomsticks in it. Look, Harry heard one of them say, New Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes, and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens and eel's eyes, tottering piles of spell books, quills, and rolls of parchment, potion bottles, globes of the moon. Gringotts, said Hagrid. They had reached a snowy white building that towered over the other little shop. Standing beside its burnished bronze doors, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold, was... Yep, that's a goblin, said Hagrid quietly as they walked up the white stone steps toward him. The goblin was about a head shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors silver this time, with words engraved upon them. Here's what those words said. Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed, for those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Like I said, you'd be mad to try and rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed them through the silver doors, and they were in a vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind a long counter, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins and brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count, leading off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for the counter. Morning, said Hagrid to a free goblin. We've come to take some money out of Mr. Harry Potter's safe. You have his key, sir. Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid, and he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits Ew. over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on their right, weighing a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Ooh, that's a good simile. A pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. If you've ever had a campfire or maybe a fireplace in your house and all those bright red embers down at the bottom of the fire. This pile of rubies looked like that. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be in order. And I've also got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid importantly, throwing out his chest. It's about the you-know-what in vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will have someone take you down to both vaults. Grip hook! Grip hook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Grip hook toward one of the doors leading off the hall. What's the you know what in vault 713? Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret. Hogwarts business. Dumbledore's trusted me. More than my job's work to tell you that. Grip hook held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more marble, was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downward, and there were little railway tracks on the floor. Griphook whistled, <whistles> and a small cart came hurdling up the tracks toward them. They climbed in, hagged with some difficulty, and were off. At first, they just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. 
Harry tried to remember left, right, right, left, middle, forward, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Grip Hook wasn't steering. Ooh, it sounds kind of like a roller coaster. How fun. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon, but too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. I never know, Harry called to Harry over the noise of the, sack, noise of the cart. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmite's got an M in it, said Hagrid. And don't ask me questions just now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green, and when the cart stopped at last beside a small door in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had to lean against the wall to keep his knees from trembling. Grip, ho Grip Hook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. <gasps> Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's. It was incredible. Man, put yourself in Harry's shoes for a minute. How would you feel if you opened up this vault and you went from having no money to having all this shimmering gold right in front of you? I bet he is super excited. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this or they'd have had it from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained how much Harry cost them to keep? And all the time, there had been a small fortune belonging to him buried deep under London. What do you think? Do you think he's, like, imagining all the things he can buy now? I would guess. He's like, man, now I can buy that thing I always wanted. Hmm, what would you buy if you suddenly found out you had this whole big amount of money you didn't know about? Maybe some shoes. Maybe a PlayStation. Well, let's see. Harry's got to go get his school supplies for now. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon, and twenty-nine nuts to a sickle. It's easy enough. Right. That should be enough for a couple of terms. We'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to Grip Hook. Vault 713 now, please, and can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Grip Hook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurtled around tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine, and Harry leaned over the side to try to see what was down at the dark bottom, but Hagrid groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Hmm, how are they going to open it up? Stand back, said Grip Hook importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, They'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Grip Hook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Grip Hook with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside this top security vault, Harry was sure. And he leaned forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in a brown paper bag lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but he knew better than to ask. Hmm, very mysterious. It's very well protected, so it must be very valuable, but it doesn't look important at all. I wonder if later in the story we're going to find out what it is. Come on, back to this infernal cart, and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best if I keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. Well, this is a perfect stop to stop and make an inference, right? So an inference is when we combine with what we already know, our background knowledge, with what it says in the text. So it's kind of like reading between the lines is another way of thinking about it. So Hagrid is getting back on this cart, kind of like a roller coaster, and he says, it's best if we keep my mouth shut. So we're thinking, wait, why does he need to keep his mouth shut? Like, is it because he doesn't want to talk or... Oh, wait, we know that he was feeling sick before. We know that some people get really sick when they ride roller coasters. I bet he's saying that he needs to keep his mouth shut so that he doesn't throw up everywhere. Duh. One wild cart ride later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know where to run first now that he had a bag full of money. He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to a pound to know that he was holding more money than he'd had in his whole life, 
more money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Hagrid, nodding toward Madame Milken's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slipped off for a pick-me-up in the leaky cauldron? I hate them Gringotts carts. He did still look a bit sick, so Harry entered Madame Milken's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Milken was a squat, smiling witch dressed all in mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said when Harry started to speak. Got the lot here, another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with a pale, pointed face was standing on a footstool while a second witch pinned up his long black robe. Madame Mucking stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipped a long robe over his head, and began to pin it to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts, too? Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying my books, and my mother's up the street looking at wands, said the boy. He had a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off to look at racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting me one, and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Hmm. Yeah, he also does seem kind of like a spoiled brat. Huh. Have you got your own broom? The boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Quidditch at all? No, Harry said again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house, and I must say I agree. Know what house you'll be in yet? No, said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be a Slytherin. All my family have been. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Hmm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, said the boy, suddenly nodding toward the front window. Hagrid was standing there, grinning at Harry and pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. That's Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy, I've heard of him. He's a sort of servant, isn't he? He's the gamekeeper, said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I've heard he's sort of savage. Lives in the hut on the school grounds and every now and then gets drunk, tries to do magic, and ends up setting fire to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you, said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They were a witch and wizard, if that's what you mean. I really don't think they should let the other sword in, do you? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never heard of Hogwarts until they get the letter. Imagine. I think they should keep it in the old wizarding families. What's your surname, anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madame McKean said, That's you done, my dear. And Harry, not sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped down from the footstool. Well, I should see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream Hagrid had brought him. Chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. Mm. What's up? said Hagrid. Nothing, Harry lied. They stopped to buy parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed color as he wrote. When they left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how little you know. Not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Melkin. And he said people from Muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a Muggle family. If he'd known who you were, he's grown up knowing your name if his parents are wizard and folk. You saw what everyone in the Leek Cauldron was like when they saw you. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were the only ones with magic in them and a long line of Muggles. Look at your mum. Look what she had for her sister. So what is Quidditch? It's our sport. Wizard sport. It's like, like soccer in the muggle world. Everyone follows Quidditch. Played up in the air on broomsticks and there's four balls. Sort of hard to explain the rules. And what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? School houses. There's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff are a lot of old duffers, but... I bet I'm a Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Hagrid darkly. There's not a single witch or wizard who went bad that wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Vol, sorry, you know who was at Hogwarts? Years and years ago, said Hagrid. 
They brought Harry's school books in a shop called Flourish and Blots, where the shelves were stacked to the ceilings with books as large as paving stones bound in leather, books the size of postage stamps and covers of silk. Oh, that's so tiny. Books full of peculiar symbols and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who never read anything, would have been wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from curses and counter curses. Bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies with the latest revenges. Hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tying, and much, much more. By Professor Vindictus Viridian. I was trying to find out how to curse Dudley. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the mogul world except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You'll need a lot more study before you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list. But they got a nice set of scales for weighing potion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecary, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell. A mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dried roots, and bright powders lined the walls. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snarled claws hung from the ceiling. Ooh. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for supplies of some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns at 21 galleons each and minuscule glittery black beetle eyes, five nuts a scoop. Outside the apothecary, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. Just your wand left. Oh yeah, and I still haven't got you a birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get your animal. Not a toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful. Carry your mail and everything. Twenty minutes later, they left Ilop's Owl Emporium, which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering, jewel-bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage that held a beautiful snowy owl, fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, said Hagrid gruffly. Don't expect you've had a lot of presents from them Dursleys. Just Ollivander's left now. Only place for wands. Ollivander's. And you gotta have the best wand. A magic wand. This was what Harry had really been looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read Ollivander's. Makers of fine wands since 382 B.C. Whoa, that's over 2,000 years ago. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place, empty except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he'd entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too, because there was a loud crunching noise, and he quickly got off the spindly chair. Oop, sounds like maybe he broke the chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches, pliable, a little more power, and excellent for transfiguration. Man, this guy has a really good memory. He can remember... The wands that Harry's parents bought years and years and years ago? Well, I say your father favored it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where... Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches, you... Powerful wand, very powerful, and in the wrong hands. Well, if I had known what that wand was going to do into the world. He shook his head, and then to Harry's relief spotted Hagrid. Rubus, Rubus Hagrid, how nice to see you again. 
Oak, sixteen inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one, but I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Er, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Er, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm, that's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and around his head. As he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heartstrings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realized that the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, what? Why does he need to know what the measurement between his nostrils is to pick out his wand? The, me the tape measure was doing this on its own. Mr. Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter, try this one. Beechwood and dragon heartstring, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit. But Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feather, seven inches, quite whippy. Try. Harry tried, but he hardly raised the wand when it, too, was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here. Ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it out. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair. But the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry. We'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now. Yes? Why not? Unusual combination. Holly and Phoenix feather. Eleven inches. Nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light onto the walls. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried, Ah, bravo! Yes, indeed! Oh, very good! Well, well, well! How curious! How very curious! He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, muttering curious. Hmm, curious. Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather. Just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why, its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Mm. Yes. Thirteen and a half inches, you. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from the shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawking at them on the underground, laden as they were with all their funny-shaped packages, with a snowy owl asleep in its cage on Harry's lap. Yeah, what, what would you think if you were walking around the city or driving around and someone just carrying an owl? You'd be a little bit surprised and confused, huh? Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realized where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger, and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. You all right, Harry? You're very quiet, said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He just had the best birthday of his life. And yet, he chewed his hamburger, trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander, 
but I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Vol- Sorry, I mean, the night my parents died. Hagrid leaned across the table, behind the wild beard and eyebrows he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him an envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September. King's Cross. It's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys? Send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the window, but he blinked and Hagrid had gone. And that is the end of chapter five. Wow, that was kind of a long chapter, so thanks for hanging in there with us. But Harry's life is changing so much, um, and it's fun to see where things are going. And you should be proud because you are 88 pages into this book now. Yeah, you're making great progress. Look at all those pages you've read. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, and tomorrow we'll enjoy chapter six together, which is called The Journey from Platform Nine and Three Quarters. See you tomorrow.